For this week's session, we want to talk much about uh, theologically guided strategies of work as empowerment. We're now entering into session number four. It means you're more than halfway through the course. We realize there's a lot of material in this, and perhaps some of the ideas are new to you, uh, but we want to make it practical also for you. But first of all, we've got to talk about the systems of the city, systemic evil, and understanding resistance, that is, the powers, and then look at models of equipping for the gathered life and models for equipping for the dispersed life. We need to understand that the city is not just a demographic concentration of people. It, the understanding of city comes uh, has a number of different layers to it. Yes, it is a population center that spawns alternate value systems. Those of you who have lived in the country or small town or in the city uh, quickly recognize that the city spawns these different sets of values. I don't want to make uh, total generalizations because there's lots of people who live in the city who still uh, maintain some of the older, more traditional value systems. You've got immigrants coming from other parts of the world that have their particular value systems. But in general, uh, the city does have an influence on us that over time begins to compress us into its kind of cosmopolitan culture. It also is a new way of life or a rhythm of life that is distinct from the rural or small town lifestyles. I say that because seasons of the year play a much bigger role in the life of small town or rural uh, areas, uh, in part because of the mating season of the animals and the crops and when they grow and when they are harvest, harvested. Uh, also the day is structured differently. It seems like in major cities that there's not much difference between day and night. Although what we see is a very different kind of population that converges on the downtowns of the city during the day than there is at night time. People come in for entertainment in the night time. Uh, you have your uh, street people who tend to be uh, moving around at the night time and then sleep uh, longer portions of the day. And so you got different demographics, but that there's always activity going on in many of the major cities of the world. And then it's a place that attracts and manipulates and dispenses power. That power is defined in many different ways. It's uh, political power. It's economic power. It is cultural power. And then uh, the city is known as the hub of innovation and change. Some of that innovation uh, is good. It's profitable. It's value-added. Some of the innovation and change can be very negative. And there can be resistance to change, but usually the resistance to change in the city uh, is far less than it is in the rural and small town areas. Uh, in fact, uh, technological change happens first in the city because that's where the uh, manufacturing centers are. And then... Uh, uh, yes, technical change, uh, material change, uh, but changing in ideas is a much slower process. Changing in behaviors oftentimes is conti contingent upon the change in the material things. But uh, changing in ideas, oftentimes we continue to live with the legacy of past uh, ways of thinking. But even that changes quicker in the city than it does somewhere else. The city is also generally a place of cultural and economic diversity, resulting often in cultural clash and economic disparity. So you see all kinds of extremes in the city. You see the very rich in certain sectors. You see the very poor in other sectors. And then uh, the city provides opportunities for social mobility and anonymity. These are two terms that were coined by 
a theologian back in the 1960s. The terms were not coined, but the understanding that the city very much marries anonymity or prides itself in anonymity and uh, in mobility. Uh, the fellow who wrote this and presented these ideas uh, in a theological sense was Harvey Cox, professor at Harvard University uh, Divinity School. And uh, he celebrated that mobility allowed remarkable freedom that in many ways uh, represents uh, a core value of the gospel. That people can move up, but they can also move down socioeconomically. That anonymity gives people the opportunity for new starts. And that they're not completely hounded by their past behaviors or their past misdeeds. And so, in some sense, the city mediates grace to people. It also concentrates collections of subcultures and critical masses that become self-sustaining. And so uh, you've got immigrant groups that are able to produce newspapers in their own language and, and uh, religious centers and social centers and stores that provide the food elements. Same thing is true, for instance, of the gay population, that there is in small towns very little affirmation but in larger cities, you can create the subcultures or the subcultures emerge in the urban environment in ways that are self-sustaining because uh, there are people in sufficient numbers to allow this to happen. And so that can either be healthy or it can be pathological. And then uh, it survives by the healthy interplay of its various in. Uh, infrastructural systems and then the city is not just an organization but it is an organism with its life unto itself that is in constant dynamism organization tends to be very flat by that I mean that uh, the organization can be tracked out on a piece of paper and you can show the relationships between one part of the organization to another part of the organization. It tends to seem static, although organizations are not static. But uh, the city itself seems to be much more contoured, much more lively, much more uh, dynamic, much more in change, much more holistic. Uh, much more lively and in that sense we call it an organism in some sense it is similar to or parallel to the description of the human body in 1st Corinthians chapter 12 uh, my wife being a scientist uh, out of the biological sciences she tells me that the human body at the physiological level, level is a complex interplay between all kinds of systems these include the neurological system, the muscul musculoskeletal system, the cardiovascular system, the immune system, the ear, nose, and throat system. I wish there was a word that would kind of uh, tie all of those things together. Psychiatric system, which would be the mind, of course. The endocrine system, the I'm sorry, ophthalm Melodic system. Kind of ironic that I stumble over this because my wife's major area of research is in this area. The pulmonary system, hematological system, the dermatological system, the urinary system, the gynecological system, and the gastrointestinal system. That's quite a mouthful of complex words, but you understand that the body is is an organism it is dynamic all of these systems interplay with each other so what do these systems teach us well they teach us that all are necessary for the adequate functioning of the body uh, obviously you know there are places where you can be deprived of one of the systems you can be blind uh, but uh, 
You could have skin disease. Uh, you can survive, but the quality of life is very much impaired when one of these systems, in some sense, is damaged or, or diseased. When one of these systems is diseased or injured, uh, there is fortunately oftentimes a backup or redundant system that seeks to repair the damage. That's why we've got immunological systems, the immune system, which uh, sends its white corpuscles or its white uh, cells on in to fight and uh, heal the area of the infection or the area of the trauma. That one disease system can traumatize or destroy other systems, then we learn that if indeed it's too serious, then death sets in. Scripture picks up on the same metaphor with something of the same em emphasis. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, 25 through 26, it says, The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. Though all of its parts are many, they form one body. There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. What we see in this verse is that the body is also an organism, uh, with each part being very interrelated, mutually dependent upon the other parts. Well, let's take that whole metaphor and trans transfer it on over to the city. In similar fashion, the city, or any metropolitan statistical area, and that's the term, by the way, that's technically used by the government of the United States, because, frankly, uh, city limits uh, are rather uh, ambivalent, and oftentimes, well, they say, for instance, the city of Los Angeles is 88 communities all seeking for a center. They may have separate individual political uh, identifications, but in some sense it's all still the same mass of people living in certain kind of demographic and dense circumstance. And so the term metropolitan statistical area would be the much larger ter term that looks at the entire uh, profile of a metropolitan area. Uh, this city, or MSA, is an organi organism with a variety of systems that interplay with each other. I put down here some of the systems that I see that uh, work within the city. You've got the transportation system. That determines how people get around. you got the we welfare and social service system. Determines how people in crisis or chronic conditions economically survive. You've got the communications and information system, which determines how people are informed. You've got the political system, which determines how people are governed. The legal system determines how people in conflict resolve disputes or protect themselves. The economic system, which determines how people are employed or exchange services. You have the public work system. And I will not go on to give you the descriptors on this, but the health care system, the recreational entertainment system, the educational system, the defense emergency system, uh, various uh, streams of religious systems, the social service system the technological system, the land management system. Uh, these are all systems that interplay very similarly to the way in which the systems in the body interplay. That's why we call it an organism and not an organization. So when one system is sick and diseased, like the physical body, the whole community is affected. A healthy body rushes its resources to the disease system to bring health to it. However, if the disease or the pathology is too great, then the whole body is profoundly affected, and it becomes very diseased. It becomes a malaise unto death. And we do know that cities, uh, some cities, 
many cities have existed in the past and then just disappeared off the map because the weight of its disease systems from within or the lack of preparation in, in being strong enough to combat whatever it is that attacks them from without results in their becoming uh, deceased, dead cities. Cities do die. Indeed, we are seeing cities like Detroit that are increasingly in a process of dying. So what, what are our options? Well, we can live in our ghettoized communities, well protected from or oblivious to the disease around us. We take great pride in the fact that we're not touched or we're not uh, involved with the problems of the city. And we can do this in a number of different ways. We can really disengage completely from real life, live in our own little protected communities. We c c can cocoon. In other words, geographically, just uh, put guards outside, keep people away from us, uh, live in a protected, secure community. Or we can just take pot shots at the ungodly world around and just not engage or do anything about it, but just critique it. A lot of Christians do this. They find certain areas or certain groups of people and they create their stereotypes and they can make their criticisms and express their hostilities, but they play no part at all in integrating and engaging these areas in the name of Jesus Christ. I think oftentimes about the public school system and uh, I've got mixed feelings on this. There are some people who I think probably ought to be in private Christian schools. But there are other situations that if we pulled all the Christians out of the private schools and then uh, turned around and criticized the private schools because they don't act Christianly enough, there's a real hypocrisy in this. And uh, somewhere it seems to me that we need to have Christian young people who infiltrate these schools, learn what it is to be missionaries within these contexts, and be part of being a transformative agent uh, in their systems, in the educational systems. We need teachers who do exactly the same thing. Or another option is to create a neat division between the real world and the Christian world. Let me just throw this out. I lived when I was a small child in London, England. My dad pastored in the inner city in an area called Clapham. Uh, Clapham became very famous. Uh, if you saw the recent movie that came out called Amazing Grace, it was the Clapham sect. William Wilberforce, who played a role, a very important, significant role, uh, where he doggedly, as a member of the House of Parliament, uh, worked hard to finally get legislation passed that would free the slaves. Well, this group of people in Clapham were the upper class Methodists that came out of the John Wesley uh, Evangelical Awakening in the British Isles. And they felt like that their quality of Christianity was such that they needed to separate themselves from their worlds. And so they built around what they called uh, Clapham commons, which in some sense became their metaphoric Eden, their large mansions with their uh, drawing rooms and their libraries, their uh, parlors. And so mothers who in that generation, being perhaps the first generation due to the Industrial Revolution, freed from working, were able to raise their children in the best of conditions completely immunized from the sins of the outside world. Only the husbands were able to leave and go into the central city and engage in that very strange, complex, uh, Charles Dickens kind of world. And uh, so you had this bifurcation between the men who would engage uh, in the economics of the world outside and their wives and their children who were very much living in the Garden of Eden. 
And uh, so that's another response oftentimes that is made by people who see the world out there as being dangerous and contaminating. Uh, or sometimes uh, another response is to infiltrate the various systems of the city to utilize one's skill, job, vocation, to leverage Christian influence on the job, to transform one's context as a change agent so that in every facet of life, every facet of life becomes accountable before God. Hence, Christian ministry is not just what happens in and through churches, but that the church engages the world and its members become transformative agents right where they work. Therefore, I see the mission as being twofold. The first is become an agent of transformation within the company, the business, the institution, so that it acts more Christianly because you have been there and you have been an active proponent of change. The second is to move the company, the business, the institution, uh, in such a way to influence it positively uh, in the world of its clients, the service providers, and even the physical geographic community where it is found or what it serves. In other words, it uh, you serve as a transform transformative agent internally within the organization, or you, do, you, you leverage your influence uh, in the organization to serve the world around it uh, in a transformational way. Let me just share a case study of systems in downtown Los Angeles. It's helpful to see the city as an urban jungle. Now, these are ideas that I picked up in a course that I took at Harvard some years ago. And what you have is uh, kind of the contour of the jungle. You've got the upper canopy, you've got the middle canopy, you've got the lower canopy, you've got the shrub, you've got the ground level, and you've got the underground. And in many ways, the uh, ecology of cities is very much the same. Even it can be configured in much that same way. Uh, for instance, downtown Los Angeles, there is a hill, and it's called Bunker Hill. And at the top, you've got the highest values of that particular community. You've got the Walt Disney Center there. And you've got the Isabel Stewart Gardner uh, and the Music Hall and all of those, uh, the Chan Dorothy Chandler uh, buildings there that are all entertainment oriented placed at the very highest level that's where the limousines go that's where the high elite of the society go to be entertained and then right not far away you've got the multinational corporations and their tall buildings that project up into the sky and then you got uh, you come down a little bit you got more of the jewel, jewel, jewelry section You've got the, um, the commercial areas, and then you get down into the flats down below, in which that's where you've got your rescue missions, and that's where, you, and then finally you get down into what you call the vermin down by the Los Angeles River, which is barely a river; it's more of a gully. But uh, you can see the different configurations of the society, and yet the fact is that. Uh, uh, all are very much interrelated and that those who swing around at the tops of the upper canopy the wealthy the rich the famous uh, they in many ways are dependent upon the flow of money and the flow of of uh, resources that comes up from below and is sucked on upward like like uh, uh, a wind and it moves on up, and uh, so you begin to see the discrepancy, but you also see the interrelatedness of it all. For a long time, I was very frustrated because I realized that almost all the religious institutions were ministering at the lowest levels, the rescue missions, the, uh, the um, storefront 
church ministries and so forth. They were all down lower, but there was very little ministry that was going on at the higher levels. And yet we need to have plants at all levels of society that work their way all the way on up. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I saw as one of the wonderful movements within downtown Los Angeles, uh, where indeed uh, at, in these government buildings and the corporations and uh, all the way up to the top, there, were, there was the presence of Christians who were making a difference in some of these buildings. So what are the neglected niches in Christian influences? Well, where do we have influence with government officials? Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about the N Street uh, ministry in uh, Washington, D.C. The N Street ministry in Washington, D.C. is kind of a retreat center where uh, government officials based upon personal relationships can drop in and where there is Christian discipleship that's going on. In former days it was called the fellowship. More recently it's been called the family. And it's been getting a lot of bad press recently because uh, a number of our government officials in the Senate and in the House have been involved in some moral scandals who were engaged in the uh, discipleship programs in this particular location. It's not the failure of the discipleship, it's the failure of the individuals. And uh, part of the concern is that uh, what's needed is not less discipleship training, but more support systems around for those people uh, to be influenced profoundly by the gospel. But what about taxi cab drivers? Uh, where where do we uh, niche the gospel to them? Uh, security personnel, people who have to stay up all night long guarding properties. Uh, restaurant personnel, people who have to work on Sundays when we have churches and so forth. Airplane employees, department store workers, sports enthusiasts. There is, uh, I read recently in Time magazine, the sense of the monopoly that there is within professional sports, especially within football and baseball, where uh, there are Christian chaplains assigned working in that area to influence. I think this is good. Uh, I wish we had that same kind of attention in terms of some of these other categories that I'm talking about. Custodians and janitors, entertainment personnel, when I was in Los Angeles, I had the opportunity of attending a gathering of about 50 or 60 people who are in the movie and entertainment business. And they are Christians. And we had just an honest free-for-all about the temptations and the uh, challenges and the possibilities uh, of these people. Sometimes they are being discriminated against because of their faith. Other times they are doing a remarkable job of uh, motivating uh, higher qualities of entertainment. Uh, one of our gentlemen that we work with here in Kansas City, his name is Brad Moore. He spoke to my class on theology of work for about two hours. He is the producer of Hallmark uh, drama series on television and has been doing this for almost 20 years. I think he said that uh, he and his productions have earned like 65 different Emmys. And I'm deeply impressed because as we talked to him, he talked about how he selects the movies and how he selects the writers and the actors that put together these series. And uh, I realized that somebody with less integrity could have put something on that really uh, again defines morals in a very different character than uh, what the Christian faith would express. But this man conscientiously is working very hard to make sure that there is a Christian witness. When I was in India this past summer, 
we met a man who uh, is the editor of Business Outlook magazine. Uh, the magazine is uh, as slick as any Forbes publication here in the United States. But he is a Christian, and uh, he's been given uh, unusual liberty by his Hindu owners to put together a magazine that he said will mirror kingdom values in the business world. And I was deeply impressed and uh, have felt like he has something very substantive, something very important uh, to share because he's grabbed this idea of the marriage between Christian influence and business. I've got down here the CEOs and corporate business people. And I think again of Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A uh, Chick and other businesses here in the United States with people who are avowedly Christian. I believe Domino's Pizza is another one of those. Uh, here in our community, Kansas City, Bill Dunn is the CEO of Dunn Construction Company. He has $3 billion worth of projects going on, not only in the city here, but around the country. And he shared with us the fact that when we had a disaster, the worst architectural disaster in the history of the United States, when an entire uh, balcony fell at the Hyatt Regency Hotel here in the city, killing over 100 people, that their corporation went in there and did the cleanup and reconstructed it, even though they had not been responsible for the damage and had not been engaged as a contractor earlier, to do the cleanup and to do it at no cost to anybody because their feeling was we don't want to make money off of a tragedy. That's the kind of influence that I think the business can have. Or blue collar workers in general. Uh, St. Paul Seminary used to have a professor by the name of Tex Sample who's written several books on how the gospel in the way it's presented is incompatible with uh, the lifestyles and the values of blue-collar workers. Did substantial research back in the 70s that indicated that this was a serious, serious problem. We need to find ways by which we can marry the world of the blue-collar worker with the gospel and with Jesus Christ who he himself was a blue-collar worker and yet we have created very much a white-collar kind of religion and then of course there are many more niches and I'd encourage you to write down as you're thinking some of the other niches that are really not being addressed by uh, Christian values and orientation suggest that you examine your own family think through a list of your own extended family where are they engaged in the systems of the city? Perhaps you've got uh, family members who are teachers. Do they see their role as just teaching 30 students or can they have an influence beyond themselves to uh, help restructure the curriculum, to help create a higher level of expectation uh, for the kind of world of education that uh, they are participating in. Uh, which systems do they represent? Write out a list of their occupations and the jobs that they represent. Do they see Christian mission in their specific system? Or are they myopic and see only uh, the paycheck at the end of the w week or the end of the month? I believe the systems can be uh, influenced profoundly by the following methods. One is to show competency on the job. It's not going to be very good to uh, try to influence the system if you are lazy and if you are hostile or if you've got bad relationships. Uh, then uh, probably better not to inform people or let people know that you're even a Christian. To express integrity on the job. When I was in Cuba I came across a young fellow who's 23 years old who'd been playing the piano for six years. And yet when I saw him play, it was the most incredible performance. He took me to his back bedroom. He had an old piano that was 100 years old in which the keys were falling off. 
he has to put bandages on his fingers to be able to play because otherwise he would damage and injure his fingers and yet he put together a DVD for me of 23 songs Christian songs that he had arranged in all kinds of very creative ways uh, I learned that he makes maybe two dollars a month off of giving piano lessons he's working on his master's degree he spends eight to ten hours a day practicing the piano it is his obsession his noble obsession and he's utilizing it to put together the most amazing worship team one of the best that I've heard anywhere in the world and I just was in awe of the intense discipleship of this young man David Galvez who was doing extraordinary uh, witnessing through his music but he said something that I'll never forget he said I want to be the best pianist in the entire nation because unless I'm the best the Communist Party will never take me seriously as a Christian it seems to me all of us really ought to think in those kinds of terms because mediocrity is not going to uh, profoundly influence or change anybody a third is to be a true friend to the other employees a true friend that listens true friend that gives advice true friend that breaks open your own heart pain and your own needs uh, but uh, there's a phrase that I use in many of my classes every meeting is a divine encounter every meeting is an exchange of gifts I think I got those phrases initially from St. Augustine let me repeat them again because I think they are key every meeting is a divine encounter so that if you find yourself in the workplace and somebody comes along don't see them as an annoyance don't see them as inferior don't see them as an interruption but recognize that perhaps in this moment is an opportunity for something eternal to happen and it may not be just specific evangelism but it may be an insight that you get that can be life-changing for you or it could be an encouragement that you give it could be the breaking down of some of the prejudices and the hostilities that naturally occur between uh, different categories of people or different uh, uh, offices that are engaged or even between management and uh, unions and employees and all of this I think you pick up from uh, Dennis Bakke uh, this very same spirit that uh, people uh, who are working together with mutual self-respect that's very very important and then to organize Bible studies and prayer groups I think that's a legitimate activity but that's not the end all of what that witness is I remember getting on a plane one time I sat right in the back and there was a young lady that I started talking with and it turns out she was from Estonia and she had migrated with her family when she was a small child she'd seen the her terrible damage that communism had done to her own family as they tried to rid themselves of Christian influence and uh, the family had survived all of this and she now has taken on a job uh, and is preparing herself to become a, a masseuse but a masseuse for therapeutical purposes I said why did you pick this occupation she said because it allows me to spend an hour or an hour and a half generally with elder elderly people who are so close to the their own demise and as I am doing the most intimate thing of touching them and rubbing them where uh, their body is ailing I have this intimate opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them and she says God has put me in this as a ministry At the end of the conversation uh, she added this comment she said when you first got on the plane and uh, 
let me know that you were a Christian, I was disappointed. Because every time that I get on the plane, I pray that God put a pagan beside me so that I could have the chance of witnessing to that person. I thought, you know, the nerve, the gall, the courage, the uh, inspiration of this young lady, 21 years of age, who uh, really sees what her mission is, has defined it, and is working towards what God has called her to do. I appreciate that. And so, uh, yes, it's important to uh, organize Bible studies and prayer groups, but it's also important to invite fellow workers to church. But it's also important to express gestures of assistance or compassion when others are in need. To show balance and fairness in both responsibilities and in relationships. I love these quotations by Martin Luther King, Jr. He says, All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Let me repeat. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Another quotation by him. Whatever your life's work is, do it well. A man should do his job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could do it no better. And then this last quotation. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. I'm reminded of a fellow that was presented at the Lausanne Conference in Manila in 1989. It was the night in which we celebrated the persecuted church. And he came out. He'd spent many years in isolation for his preaching in uh, China. And when he came out to us, he'd only recently been released. And he talked about how in the concentration camp where he was, uh, he was given the responsibility well, let me just back up. He would witness to everybody that he could about his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the uh, prison officials were so offended by his witness, they decided to put him outside the camp. And so every day, early in the morning till late at night, he'd have to dig the cesspools. They put the guards around him there, and he said, I would dig and I would sing. And he said, I'd started to sing, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am one of his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And I just thought to myself, well, he made this statement. He said, the smell, the stench they told me was so bad that the guards had to back away and remain very much at a distance from me. But he said I'd sing these songs out loud and all I could smell was the fragrance of flowers. I thought, you know, there's not much dignity. There's not much sophistication to being a prisoner digging in cesspools. But if that's what God has given you to do, do it with all your might. I saw a film recently while I was on the plane, and uh, it was called the, uh, oh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but it's the story of the editor of Elle magazine, who suffered a terrible debilitating stroke, and the story is a real story. The man finds himself laid out prostate on a bed 
and the only thing he can move is his eyelid. And as he moves his eyelid, uh, one of his therapists comes to him and treats him to a therapeutic concept that maybe by the blinking of the eye, he could communicate what letter of the alphabet that she uh, would record that would help him put together uh, a system of communication. Out of that, he wrote a book, died shortly after the book was published. It's the most amazing account of somebody who, in the helplessness of his condition, when other people would look on him and say, well, he's just a vegetable, yet that wink of an eye was his work and his task, and he and the therapist working together in tandem, able to accomplish the only thing that he could accomplish, and yet it became a profound uh, testimony and a um, rich understanding of the world of those who are so debilitated. Uh, and I think, you know, so many of us have the privilege of full health and uh, alert mind and freedom to write and what we accomplish so little. And yet here is this man who with just the wink of an eye tells his story in the most poignant and richest of ways. So, anyway, uh, how do we influence the system? Well, I believe it may require a little bit more imaginative responses other than just uh, witnessing and testifying. One is to measure the values of the institution against biblical values. Is the institution living up to the injunctions of Scripture? Obviously, if it's not a Christian organization, uh, that may not be the discourse that's going on within the organization. You may not want to bring in the Bible and proof text what you're trying to say. But at the same time, there is kind of a universal understanding of what integrity is. And there are ways by which that can be communicated to call organizations to a higher level of value systems that begin to mirror what the Bible has to say. And then influencing the assumptions and the values of the organizational body to better mirror Christian values. Another way is to recommend alternative ways of dealing with service, product, or relationships to better mirror the kingdom. In other words, to uh, provide some creative ideas of some alternatives. Lots of organizations get into habits and it takes somebody thinking outside of the box and uh, it can be somebody who uh, can think outside of the box but their ideas are ideas that are detrimental to the organization and to the purposes and to human uh, integrity. But if the Christian gets there and presents something uh, that has real merit to it, then the organization may very excitedly respond to it. Not because they've been hostile to change, but because nobody's ever presented to them a better idea. Uh, blowing the whistle, of course, is another way in which we influence the systems. When there is injustice or unfairness or dishonesty, when these things are taking place. Another is to empower those around you, if, even if it means limiting or deferring your own power. Uh, we are power grabbers so many of the time. And one of the problems is, as Christians, we think we're leaders and we think we've got the end all, know all of every situation, so we speak out dogmatically in ways that oftentimes alienate and disempower people around us. Seems to me that I like the whole uh, spirit of Paul who talks about deferring to one another or start at the bottom of the table rather than stop at the, start at the top of the table and allow others to invite you 
to move on up as they see the qualities of your leadership along the way. But that allows other people to have input uh, in the process. Uh, another is to seek to diffuse unnecessary conflict. Scripture talks about blessed are the peacemakers. And I don't see an awful lot of people uh, called Christians who are doing peacemaking. Because what we do is spend time, oftentimes, between fellow Christians trying to sort things out and trying to reconcile things. When the fact is, most of the serious conflicts of life are uh, outside in the world. And that there is a, a very special need of people to be engaged in peacemaking tax, tasks or conflict resolution. Another is to seek to move the organization beyond just the profit motif or motive. A further one is leveraging the organization to make a qualitative difference in its world. We've mentioned this before. To think beyond its own institutional boundaries. To think about how can we utilize this organization to make change beyond it. I admire Bill Gates who's now taken his finances and put it into a foundation that uh, is paying out huge sums of money all around the world for particular projects where there is genuine need. And so uh, that becomes very important. Uh, what are some of the obstacles to transforming the systems? Because realistically, you know, a lot of us have very deep uh, barriers uh, and very light influence in being able to transform systems. The first one is inappropriate work setting. And that is there are some jobs that just by their very nature cannot glorify God. If so, I'd suggest that you name some of them. We looked at some of the occupations earlier. But it's very important to look and see, is there something inherent within this job that really is contrary to the purposes of God? A second is the internal corruption of the organization. Can a business be so corrupt that all employees become corrupted by it? I think that can happen. If that's the case, maybe you ought to think very seriously about getting out of the organization. Maybe it's just too far gone. Maybe it's got a detrimental effect upon your own uh, spiritual life. And maybe you ought to pray and plead for God to find you an alternative assignment. Third is program limitation due to confined roles or lack of interpersonal contact or administrative rules or curbed influence. There are all kinds of ways in which certain roles within certain kinds of companies really are not ready for the kind of influence that you might have. On the other hand, maybe you can outlast uh, these uh, inhibiting factors in such a way that over time, your own credibility, or as they say, street cred, grows. And uh, with the result that maybe 15, 20 years from now, if you're in the same kind of position, you will have far greater influence than what you have right now. I have a little personal experience. I was in Peace Corps in Brazil for a number of years. I was the only Christian or avowed Christian within the group of young Peace Corps volunteers that went out. Uh, I learned to love and care for those uh, men and women and uh, found areas of decency in their lives and found areas of misguidedness. Uh, but they were my friends. Every five years we get together. The number has grown uh, smaller over the years as several people have died and uh, others we've lost track of. But every five years, 14 or 15 of us get together. And it's been very interesting, the change in the transformation that's taken place in their lives as I've been able to track how the Holy Spirit has moved, not because of me, but because of just life life events in their lives. 
Some are important lawyers. Others are teachers. Others have been in the entertainment business or they've been in uh, sports and so forth. As I've tracked their lives, I've found out that my relationship with them 35, 40 years ago uh, has matured in such a way that they now want to hear things from me and can bear my testimony and oftentimes identify with my testimony in ways that just were not happening uh, when we were together many years ago. Yes, I shared my testimony, but life experiences have brought them much closer to me over the course of the years. And uh, for me, it's one of those delightful things that uh, when I came to the point of graduation from college, I had several alternatives. I could have gone on to seminary, continued to live in my religious cocoon. Or I could have joined the military, gone to Vietnam, or joined Peace Corps. Selected Peace Corps because I felt like I owed the government service. But I also wanted to do it in a creative, meaningful fashion. And it put me out there in this workaday world where I learned so many lessons and built so many relationships that have been of great value to me ever since. And even though my mother wept because I was not following the normal course of moving into missions and getting out there as an ordained elder in my denomination, yet now we look back and see the wisdom of God's guidance in that whole process that allowed me to experience the world as it was and to see it not only through the eyes of North Americans but to see it through the eyes of Brazilians. So that became very important. Uh, sometimes we're called to confront the powers that corrupt the system and, then, and, and their manifest institutions. We have the wonderful example of Elijah who confronts the gods of Baal. And uh, there is no middle ground on something like this. He stands there and his life is at risk. But God exonerates him. And the fire comes down and burns the altar. And uh, the gods of Baal, they are defeated. They are actually killed in mass. But it is a testimony of that God exonerates over time when we put ourselves on the line for our faith. You see in the story of Amos confronting the corrupt legal system. Uh, in Amos chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. We see it as Jesus confronts the corrupt economic religious systems in uh, his encounter with the marketers uh, in the Gentile uh, plaza uh, of the temple. And they uh, are marketing religi religion, religiosity. They are requiring people to jump through hoops to find God. And so they have to take their money and put it into holy money. And then they get ripped off by the prices that are being charged by the uh, for the holy instruments, the animals that are going to be sacrificed for their own salvation. And uh, so the picture is that uh, here are people who are honestly searching for right relationship with God but that the religious entities themselves had set the bar so high that few people could jump over it. And those that had the money to be able to jump over it were being exploited. And uh, so uh, a relationship with God, forgiveness, was becoming increasingly inaccessible. And Christ marches into those systems, challenges them in almost a horrifying scene, where you've got the chaos of the animals running around, tables being overturned, uh, Jesus with his whip, uh, chasing out all of these uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, there are times in which confrontation has to be made. And uh, yet we've become so meek and mild as Christians, so domesticated, that there's none of this ire that allows us 
to take on the anger of God. Part of the component of love is anger, and we'll discuss this later. There are two facets of the ministry of the church. The first is the church gathered. This is the church as we normally know it, the centripetal mission of the church. That is to pull people into the confines of a church building or church institution, concentrate all ministry in that environment. The church gathered should be the public witness of the communion of the saints. There's nothing wrong with this. Uh, it's a place for rest and for restoration, for accountability, for training, for community, for joint celebration, and for resourcing the mission of God uh, in the church scattered. If it becomes an end in itself, then we have failed. And too often times I've seen the church being an end in itself. It is the means, it is not the end. Therefore, the op optimal activity of the church should be uh, the church which is scattered. That is, to be engaged in the mission of the world within the systems, to bring them and these under the aegis of so sovereignty of Christ, not just by individual conversions, but where, wherever or where in the, where in the church I'm sorry, wherein the institutions themselves become converted. Verse of Scripture from Ephesians, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Philippians, Then God gave Christ the highest place and honored his name above all others, so that at the name of Jesus everyone will bow down those in heaven, those on earth, under the earth, and to the glory of God the Father, everyone will openly agree that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, God wants to be the center of all uh, institutional life. The last is uh, to see the city itself as a work of art. Uh, I've included an article that I want you to read which is by Clinton Stockwell. And uh, it's just a tentative article that he personally gave to me for commentary, and I thought its point was very good. It reminds us that just like the painter paints a canvas, the city itself is a collage of the creative collective imagination of its residents through many generations. If there is blight and if there's ugliness, this is because the imagination has been sullied by sin and by selfishness and shabbiness so that the art of the city is damaged, destroyed, or devalued. By art, I'm talking about layout. I'm talking about uh, greenery. I'm talking about uh, architectural styles. I'm talking about uh, movement of people. All of this, in some sense, is a dynamic art form. The Christian seeks to turn it around through the instruments that his or her vocation provides, be they remedial, creative, or confrontative, the three things that we mentioned earlier. Summary quotation by Paul Marshall. The scope of redemption in Christ is the same as the scope of creation. In other words, God is wanting to convert the systems but if we abandon the systems, if we ignore the systems, if we live in our little church world detached from the systems, how can we be agents of redemption in Christ in these particular worlds that also are to be accountable before him? Let me talk a little bit about the Sabbath. The church gathered. What is the meaning of the Sabbath? Sabbath has many meanings. Uh, it is law, and it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Actually, these are meanings that point ahead. It was a gift. It was the celebration of creation and redemption. In other words, he gave us the Sabbath as a point of blessing in our lives. Uh, it was a vocation, a calling. In other words, God himself worked into rest. 
And so we made in the image, we work into rest. Uh, we have a special calling to come out and to be engaged in that rest of the Lord. See that in Genesis chapter 2. It was a sacrament of time. In other words, uh, this slice of time is symbolic of the rest of the week, which is governed by God, but it comes to a culmination. It comes to a peak. It's not something apart from. It's not something separated from. But it is a culmination of what is done the rest of the week. The little book that I read a number of years ago that I really enjoyed is called Mr. God, This is Anna. Anna is described as a six-year-old theologian, mathematician, philosopher, poet, and gardener. The life and death are told charmingly in this book by Finn. Her insights dovetail with the understanding of the Sabbath as presented here. I don't have time to read it, and I've not given you a copy of it. But let me just draw out some phrases that kind of excited me when I read this. This is not a religious book. I mean, it is a religious book, but it's not specifically a Christian book. But it's full of Christian insights. Uh, Anna asks, uh, asks the question of Finn, the writer of the book. What was God's greatest creative act? And then she answered it herself. It was the seventh day. Of course it was. The seventh day. No, he made rest. That's the biggest miracle. Rest is when he was finished making all the things Mr. God had undone all the muddle. Then you can rest. So that's why rest is the very biggest miracle of all. Don't you see? You have to have a muddle in your head before you really know what rest is. Perhaps, as Anna suggests, we need to engage the muddle of the six days of the week to fully know what the rest of Sabbath is. Or another way of expressing it, we really need to follow Jesus into the muddle of the world as it is, allowing our feet to be bruised and bloodied in transit. For him to offer the foot washing that he gives in John chapter 13. To sing, He Touched Me, in the antiseptic setting of a church worship experience is less authentic than to feel the massage of Jesus hands on one's feet when you've been with him out in the world that's kind of my image that I have is the fact that I can stand in a worship service and raise my hands and sing that old Gaither song he touched me oh he touched me oh the joy that floods my soul well, yeah, but what is stimulating that sense of touch? Well, the communion of people standing around doing the same thing? Is it being programmed by something that's in the church bulletin? Uh, to me, that's rather inauthentic. I don't want to demean it, but it just seems to me that the touch of God is an earned touch. It's not a manipulated touch. It's a touch where, if you've been following Jesus around, then it becomes the touch that he has because you've really partnered with him and you've suffered with him along the way. And he reaches out his hands and massages your feet and uh, puts some ointment on those feet because he himself has experienced the same bloodiness and the same bruisedness along the way. Let me share just three models that integrate the gathered and the scattered life of the people of God. I used to have a friend in uh, California. His name was John. I think he was 19 years old when his uh, dad suddenly died. His dad owned a tool and dye business. And John inherited that business at a very young age don't think he ever finished college but uh, the longer that he worked in his business he saw the business grow and he became more and more aware that in that growth more and more Hispanics were attaching themselves to uh, the employment roster and uh, he began to realize that a lot of these people 
would talk to each other in Spanish. He didn't understand the dynamics, what was going on. But his heart went out to them because he saw them in ways that most people, most pastors don't even see their own church members. Because he'd see them for 40, 50 hours a week. He'd see that uh, during lunchtime, uh, the wives would bring in uh, their Central American uh, uh, diet, their, their, their food stuffs. And uh, he got the chance to meet many of the kids, and he began to become aware that some of them had legal problems, and some of them had medical problems, and most of them had financial problems, and that these were people for whom Christ died. Well, he said to himself, I owe it to them to learn Spanish. So he went through some intensive coursework in Spanish, began to speak to them and talk to them in the Spanish language. This was appreciated, and the employees began to, to uh, not be just employees, but to become friends of his. Then he decided their issues were much more complicated than uh, just material need or gain. And so he decided to conduct a Bible study during lunchtime. And they started to come. He invited them to come in the Spanish language. And more and more they accrued until the wives were coming and the children were coming. Out of that whole influence, a church was formed because faith was formed. And it was faith done by a layperson completely unqualified as an ordained elder because he was not. And uh, yet at the same time, he was a caring person who utilized his business to become a place of hope and ministry. To me, he's one of my heroes. A second, also in Los Angeles, was uh, an organization called Christians in Government. Came very aware that in many of the high-rise uh, multinational corporations or government buildings, that there were little clusters of Christians that were coming together. And uh, some of them were meeting once a week. Uh, some of them were meeting on a daily basis. Some of them would meet on the weekends. Uh, they'd come together for some of them Bible studies, for some of them prayer meetings, for some of them uh, book reading sessions, and so forth. But they would come together in the name of Christ and find a commonality. Now, I don't know to what degree they influenced long-term the systems of which they were a part, but I had responsibilities for a major rally that brought together about 700 of these participants. There were about 60 of these groups in the very central core of Los Angeles. And we came together in a rally, and I'll never forget, looking on the platform, and there was the judge, and there was the prosecutor, and there was the defense attorney, all of them Christians, all of them in the world in somewhat hostile antagonistic positions in relationship to each other. But they had not let that spirit uh, dominate their relationships while on the job and indeed when they got together they saw each other as being all part of God's plan and recognized uh, with integrity their uh, uh, individual roles and thank God for the opportunity they had for the ministries that they were doing within that kind of a world and then uh, the third is in the Lausanne document uh, that is part of the materials reading. I would encourage you to read one of the latter chapters there that gives seven or eight different models of around the world where this practice of uh, business as mission is taking place in fairly effective ways. So there are ways where this is being done. And I suggest that it's worthy of uh, examination. Perhaps you can put together your own case studies where you see the same thing happening. So some suggestions for the scattered life of the people of God. 
These are taken from the Lausanne publication. Uh, and in fact, I believe these have been repeated earlier in somewhat different fashion. I've expressed them differently. Um, it comes from the occasional paper number 40, which is not in your materials reading. Marketplace Christians can expand their understanding of spiritual disciplines to include activities more often associated with the everyday. In other words, uh, to get out there and uh, to not have your spiritual disciplines disconnected from that world, but to make it a part of that world. To reclaim aspects of their work as spiritually significant when they see what they do as a reflection of God. And marketplace Christians can find support and fellowship in naming and responding to the presence of God in their work by linking up with other Christians in similar professions or fields of work. Just kind of like what I was talking about in terms of Christians and government in Los Angeles. And then suggestions for the gathered life of the people of God. This is within the church environment. The gathered people of God can reclaim the marketplace as a nexus for God's presence in the following ways. Number one, by bringing everyday life experiences into the Sunday worship experience. When I was pastoring, I did a study of First and Second Corinthians. And I noted in those books that there were 30 occupations mentioned. And I began to realize that in my congregation I had 10, 11, 12 of those occupations. And so I did a whole series where I actually team preached with somebody in those occupations. And so I had a landscaper and he came forward and he discussed the passage and interpreted it through his eyes and brought all kinds of new truths to me as to what he saw in the metaphoric value and the practical value of his occupation. I looked at the builder, the constructor. I looked at the teacher. I looked at the soldier. And so each one of them I highlighted in this series of sermons. It was one of the more creative things that I had the opportunity of doing. Uh, on another occasion, I discovered that I had six women in my congregation who were all artists. And so we celebrated God as creator. And we brought oh, about 30 art pieces. And we lined up the aisles and we filled up the parlor. And I had each of these women come forward and talk about the inspiration of Exodus chapter 31, uh, where the Holy Spirit came down. And I talked about how has this Holy Spirit motivated you to express yourself on this canopy in a very special way. And uh, we got the most incredible stories. And I felt how sad it has been that these women have been painting in the darkness. They've been painting in their own little privatized worlds. And nobody has ever questioned them about how they were inspired. How did they work on the gifting and the talent that God has given to them? Why have we not celebrated this before? Because God himself was the great sculptor, the great painter. And they obviously have picked up some of those characteristics. And we ought to see them and recognize them and appreciate them and be ennobled by them as they create beauty in ways that I think are consonant with uh, God's own creativity. We need to provide places of relationships of accountability. We need to provide preaching and teaching which is relevant to life in the marketplace. And I think we fail to do that oftentimes because pastors don't know what's happening in the marketplace. We need to provide pastoral support in the workplace. I'm very high on the role of chaplaincy. And not only are there chaplains in the military, which I think is a very, very significant role, chaplains in hospitals. More and more there are becoming chaplains in uh, sports teams. And I believe there are chaplains to the fire department and to the police department. And I believe there's the role of chaplain uh, to uh, 
industrial uh, complexes. And we're seeing more and more opportunities, which I think is the marriage of business with uh, ministry. We need to take the church to the workplace. I think it means far more for a pastor to go to where people work rather than to go to their homes. Homes are protected environments, but to visit them on the job in a workplace, I think, is an ideal arrangement. Because then the fellow workers can see that this person is connected to a church community, that the pastor does care, and that it allows the pastor to see his, his parishioner at the point of strength rather than at the point of weakness, where they manage large numbers of people. Uh, I went to the local regional IRS building, which hires 8,000 people. I discovered that the lady that they call the mayor is a Christian. We walked all the way around as she introduced us to many people there, and I began to realize what power this lady has, what influence she has, and yet nobody in the church knows anything about this. And uh, she shared her testimony. And it was incredible. It was not all a success story because uh, she had, has not been fed by the ministry to help her know how to handle the ethical dilemmas, how to fire people if that is needed by the economy, uh, how to deal with people's personal issues, how to keep your own integrity in the midst of the pressures of time and space within uh, the expectations of an organization like that. And for us to visit her in the workplace, it was the first time anything had ever happened like that. I remember contacting Los Angeles, the head of long-range planning for the city of Los Angeles. It turns out his name was uh, Glenn Blossom. It turns out that this gentleman is an ordained elder in the Assembly of God Church. Here is the man most responsible for the long-term development of the city of Los Angeles. And not once he had, had he ever been confronted by a Christian about what were his Christian premises what kind of city did he want to see in terms of the scriptural vision of a city and he brought together his entire team that worked with him for them to respond to the kinds of theological questions that are being raised in this particular course that you're taking right now they were elated they were hungry for this kind of a moment but this could only in occur in a workplace or a neutral setting, you don't expect this kind of conversation to go on in a church. Closing quotation. The Mohandas Gandhi states so well the systemic evil from the fall in his short description of the roots of violence. He says, the roots of violence are caused because we have wealth without work. We got pleasure without conscience. We got knowledge without character. We have commerce without morality. We have science without humanity. We've got worship without sacrifice. We've got politics without principle. This is almost a ruthless indictment of so much of our culture. And it seems to me that whereas he has diagnosed what the problem is, it's up to Christians to move in the area of work, conscious, character, morality, humanity, sacrifice, principle. These are parts of the gifts of the Spirit that allow us to be transformative agents within that world. Christians ought to be the ones who are the antidote, the peacemakers to the world of the corrupted systems of this world. This has been a long lecture. I think there's a lot of material in there. Uh, it's taken one hour and 24 minutes for me to discuss this, but I hope it's provoked in you a real desire to, if not to enter into the systems, to prepare people to enter into the systems and to affirm them, 
to guide them and let them guide you as to how to instruct and how to prepare people for this area of ministry in the workplace.